Charlie Rob Walbridge is nationally recognized. Uh, he's an expert in, in many aspects of the whitewater. He's been a true pioneer in the safety and the manufacture of safety equipment. Um, Charlie, was that picture recent or was that another one from 20 years ago there? That one may be about, that may be, you know, 10 or 12 years old. Uh, I, I took these right off your website. So thanks for access to that. Charlie's got a bunch of books out. Uh, I'm sure he'll mention those and hopefully we'll have opportunity to uh, check out his website. Um, you guys can read through this. I apologize for not putting my glasses on and, and uh, reading this all to you, but we'll leave it up for a few minutes while, while Charlie talks and then he can go into his PowerPoint presentation. Uh, welcome, Charlie, and thanks again for, for responding on such short notice and uh, you've been the highlight of our presentation so far this year. So welcome. Well, thanks for thanks very much. Um, what I was going what I was going to do was to go over a little bit of the history of, of uh, safety and rescue and for the paddling community, and I'm going to. Oh, excuse me. Um, do you want to share your slides? I'm going to do share screen. Okay. I'm sharing screen. Now I'm getting ready to start from the beginning. Yeah. All righty. <clears throat> Yeah, these pictures, uh, you know, I'd say probably the one at the far left, that's probably, that's probably 25 years and then maybe 10, 12 years. And the, the, the one on the far right is probably like just three or four. Um, okay, we're not seeing the, seeing it quite yet. Uh, there may be some. Oh, it's not coming through? No. Let me try it again. It, it may be a bandwidth issue. Right. Just... Okay, let me try this. There we that, go. There we okay. are. Yeah. And... From the beginning. Okay, how are we doing? Great. Okay. Now, i am got to move this over here. Okay. So... As we get started, I got started in the uh, in, in the uh, second half of the 60s, like 1967, 68. And, you know, we didn't know a whole lot. But the thing is, I don't think that there was <clears throat> that, that uh, a lot of the things that we take for granted now were there. Like these pictures... Uh, show were take or were taken in the '60s, and they show really top paddlers paddling without life jackets. Top left is John Sweet. The uh, next one down is Walt Harvest. The, the next one down is Fritz Orr, and I forget who his partner is. And then Frank Bell. Both Fritz Orr and Frank Bell were pioneers in the in the Southeast, and. For a long for a long time, people felt that they wanted to be like surfers. They wanted to be able to swim under things uh, if they uh, if they got uh, if they got got into the water. And there was a guy, Dan Sullivan, who who was paddling on the Potomac when I when I lived there back in the seventies, and uh, he didn't wear a life jacket. He was very old school, and and. Uh, the rangers gave him a hard time until finally the chief ranger said that uh, anybody who'd been pa anybody who had been paddling for more than uh, in 40 years didn't have to wear a life jacket and dan was one of the few people who'd been going that long uh this is my buddy Mar marty pecans uh we started the bucknell outing club together and we didn't know anything. Marty had been a canoe, a canoe counselor up in Maine. I was a camp counselor, but not canoeing, more 
hiking and backpacking. And I did my first real class two whitewater trip with Marty in the spring of 1967. Okay, come on, let's, there we are. And <clears throat> really the, the uh, clubs, oops, sorry. What happened over the next, uh, over the next, uh, probably 10 years or so is that clubs really got together to spread the word. Um, I joined American Whitewater when I found a magazine kicking around somewhere again, back in the, back in the sixties, the Appalachian mountain club, Whitewater handbook was really one of the few books that was published about paddling Whitewater. And that was, that was my, our Bible. Um, I was very fortunate in that uh, we were kind of trying to figure things out. We'd started in open canoes, <clears throat> then a couple of the guys got kayaks, and we were all trying to figure out kayaks. And finally, uh, you know, I decided to write the Penn State Outing Club, and we got invited to John Sweet's pool sessions up in State College, which is about an hour away from Bucknell. And that was my introduction to the whitewater community. And American Whitewater at that time was a communication vehicle between various member clubs. And the safety code was first put together in 1959. And it was, we were one of the first user groups that was really pushing the use of life jackets. And I tell people behind every line in the uh, safety code, there are probably, they're probably a couple of fatal accidents. Things like uh, wearing a life jacket and a helmet, keeping your, keeping your group together, having a lead and sweep boat, things that are taken for granted now. AW really was, a, was, a first, was the first people to push it on a national scale. This, is, this gentleman, OK Goodwin, was uh, safety chair from uh, 1970 to 1987. And he, I, met him, I met him because he did safety at, at a number of the races. He was one of the founders of the Coastal Canoeists. He was a professional designer of merchant ships and a serious whitewater competitor in C1 and C2. His daughter, Cindy, was a US whitewater team member. And one of the things he started talking about as safety chair was the conflicts that develop between river savvy, savvy paddlers and the wider, less knowledgeable society in which, which we live. And he, he was the first people person to do outreach to local government. And the 70s, when it came through, were spurred by two things. One was, of course, the movie Deliverance. And I never thought of Deliverance as, a, as something that would uh, encourage people to go paddling. But I think that people figured, hey, we'll go down the river and we'll just, uh, we'll, just skip, we'll just skip the sodomy scenes and going over the waterfall and all that. And then the 72 Olympics, and particularly Jamie McEwen's uh, gold, uh, silver, excuse me, bronze medal. Um, Jamie inspired a whole generation of young racers. And, <clears throat> and both of those things drew a lot of people into the river. But I think also that, you know, I was in my early 20s then, and uh, there were a lot of us who were kind of looking for a little adventure. And this seemed like a good way to find it. <coughs> this is... Uh, the 70s is when the sport really started to expand from just a few hotbeds to something, to something a bit broader. Uh, top left is fearless Fred Young, probably swam more class five than most of us will ever see. He was, I boated with Fred from time to time and uh, it was always a good time portaging and watching him deal with the stuff that he dealt with. And on the top right is Ron Mason. Some of you guys may remember him from uh, Denver. Um, don't know who the other folks are. 
A lot of people started out in a canoe or a raft and then moved up to a homemade kayak. And as we were discussing back then, if you wanted a kayak, there were very few places you could buy one. There were a few guys with backyard manufacturing. I ended up going to New York City and picking up a Klepper kayak. Probably the only place you could get a manufactured kayak was uh, was Klepper had a at a store in Manhattan. But, uh, you know, I had to figure out the gear and uh, it wasn't easy. This is also when uh, when whitewater outfitting really began. And the, the average guest was a fellow in his 20s or 30s who was looking for adventure. And as a young guide, I gave, I, our plan was to give them as much as they can stand. The pictures on the right are from <clears throat> are me guiding on the Chatuga, <coughs> which is a Georgia-South Carolina border. On the left, those pictures are of the Cheek Canyon, specifically Big Nasty. Big Nasty got its name because of the hole. It uh, it could it could surf quite a few people together. It was also the start of the whitewater industry. High performance pro products, uh, fiberglass boats, and blue hole canoes. Now, type three life jackets, the wearable kind of life jacket, really didn't, didn't come on for a while. The category was, was created in 1973 because the owner of Stearns, Mauricio Link, he'd been pushing the Coast Guard to approve wearable jackets, but their Coast Guard could get pretty pig-headed on some of this stuff. So uh, he started making unapproved but comfortable life jackets, and the Coast Guard immediately realized they lose control of the whole thing unless they created the Type 3 category. But it took several years, and... and uh, as somebody was saying, I, I used to sell a life jacket kit. Um, they, you know, that before that, I had a Harashock life jacket. There were people using flather shocks where, the, uh, where there were like plastic air bubbles in the jacket to, to provide flotation. Definitely not something that the Coast Guard was really, was really through, thrilled with. And racing was at the center of whitewater sport in the 70s and I really loved to race. I loved it was it was not just the racing itself because I was I was never in the t in the in the top tier but it was going to the races and hanging out with all these people and back then there were no canoe clinics or uh, or or kayak schools but going to races you could watch other people dealing with uh, dealing with the course you could take your try at it and you could get coaching from some of the very best people there some people were better coaches than others obviously um but uh that was uh that was one of my favorite things i went to six or eight races a year okay what's going on now I was at a race in upstate New in, in New York, just across the Pennsylvania border, <clears throat> called Uliout Creek. In October, we ran something called the Icebreaker Slalom. And the Icebreaker Slalom was, you know, it was a class one to two race, but it was a place where all of the, you know, all the racers would get together for a last hurrah before things got cold. And there was a there was a fatality there. I was coming down the course, and I looked downstream to that little ledge you see. Now that's that's not the release level. The, the release level was probably a foot higher, but uh, I was heading down towards that towards that area, and I see these people moving around, and you can tell when something's wrong. People move differently. They sort of have this herky jerky motion, and. Uh, from all the from all the tension, and I eddy I eddied out and hopped on shore, and there was a guy stuck underwater, 
and nobody had a clue what to do. There were a bunch of guys who were guides on the lower yacht who were the best sa safety and rescue people I knew. Nobody knew what to do. One guy jumped into the water and tried to grab him as he went past. A bunch of us got in the river and we tried to divert the water. But as soon as we started to divert the water, the water started pushing us downstream. Finally, they turned the water off at the dam. But by that time, it was really too late. I was really shaken by this, as you can, as you can imagine. This is the last place I expected to have this sort, this sort of thing. And talking to people... Nobody seemed to be particularly interested. You know, people said, oh, it's just a freak accident. And I started talking to people and eventually put together an accident report, which uh, was really the first description of foot entrapments. Now, what happened was I sent this report to a couple of canoe clubs and people wrote me and said, hey, we had something like this happen on the Nantahala hey, we had something like this happen on the OBAT. So by the time it got published in the journal, I knew that this was a thing. And that, that accident report is really what started my career. I wrote other accident reports for AW and also some more general articles for Canoe Magazine. And, you know, with the vertical pin and the, and the uh, foot entrapments, um, the, the picture you see at the bottom on the right, that's us after the guy got pulled out looking at the river and trying to figure out what happened. But, you know, some people <clears throat> want to talk about these things and other people don't. And I'm a talker. The other thing is that being a camp counselor, we were very aware of safety and we, uh, you know, we read the Appalachian Mountain Club's accident reports for the mountains so that we wouldn't make the same mistake. And eventually, after, after a report or two, I got, I got asked to be the American Canoe Association uh, safety chair. And we ended up doing some liaison with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is, at that time was very focused on, on equipment. You know, they figured the solution to everything was equipment. <coughs> and what we did was we went through all the accident reports and showed them that equipment was not the thing. And what, what their what their researcher had done is you see that about 11 percent of the accidents they were unable to determine cause somebody goes out in a boat they're missing they find somebody finds a boat a search happens they find the person 11 percent well they wanted to put the put a lot of foam into the canoes to so that it would float level the level float level flotation and it really it would it really wouldn't have worked very well. And what was really fascinating is that the big boys, like like Old Town and uh, and Grumman, they were ready to roll over and and play dead. But uh, boy, the people from Blue Hole and the people from Mad River, I remember Kay Henry just giving them the what for, because really. Brains and skill are the most important pieces of safety equipment we have, that and the life jacket. These are, and what we were pushing was education, not regulation. And these cartoons were done by a fellow named Dean Norman, who did a bunch of <clears throat> cartoons for, for us at the uh, American Canoe Association. And this was the start of working with with uh, with the broader boat safety community. Now in the 1980s, the sport continues to mature. <coughs> the bottom right picture you see is John Lugbill, Davy Hearn, and I think Kent Ford is the third person. Uh, the, the guy in the center is John Connolly, and the person on the left is Don Banducci, who later started Yakima Products 
but uh, the the sport was getting big enough that it could actually support a certain a certain amount of manufacturing. Nineteen seventy three. The Holoform River Chaser. How many of you guys remember the River Chaser? First uh, rotor molded boat. And it was, the boat itself was indestructible, but the outfitting was awful. And so what people had to do is they had to tear all the outfitting out and put, and put their own stuff in. And that wasn't really very helpful. The, well, Mir- the Perception yeah. Mirage was, was built in 1980 and the Dancer in 1982. And this is when, you know, you could really take a boat off the, off the shelf, so to speak, and paddle it. And that was a huge in- improvement. And the Dancer dominated, dominated the uh, boat market, I'd say, for the next... 12, 15 years. I and had Char- a store. Charlie, yes. Charlie, if, first of all, I, I remember the the holoform. In fact, I would rent kayaks and they'd, I'd ask them to put a foam wall in and they put in a horizontal sheet of foam. And I've had leg entrapment in holoforms. And yeah. I remember when the holoforms came out uh, and, and even the first perception. There was a lot of uh, controversy about whether you could make a safe plastic boat because oh yeah because back then uh, you had e glass boats which if you if you hit a rock or something they just broke up broke <coughs> up into pieces uh, and the plastic boats they didn't do that so they would trap the paddlers in them. And it's not just the plastic boats. The, the fiberglass boats had uh, new materials, Kevlar and other s- stuffs that didn't that were that were stronger. But you would get in a situation where the kayak would not break into pieces, and you'd get trapped in it. And there was a lot. I remember back in the in those days, there was a lot of discussion whether you could have a safe kayak. If it was even well, certainly possible. it took a long time for the for for them to uh, for them to become dominant. And part of it, and I'll talk about it later, is that the outfitting really improved. This is a 1981 Stikine River first descent with Rob Lesser. Uh, I was by this time getting the high floats made by Extra Sport. And we provided the life jackets. And you can see everybody, all the kayakers are wearing these big full-length life jackets that they're folding up at the bottom. Nobody would, nobody would do that now, but uh, that's, uh, that's, what the boys, that's what the boys did. Uh, from the left, John Wasson, Don Van Duke, uh, excuse me, John Wasson, Rob Lesser, Rick Fernald, Don Van Ducci, Lars Holbeck. And quite a crew. 1980 was also when people actually started river rescue classes. You know, we I, I was a guide in 74 for NOC and worked on and off on the uh, cheat for the, you know, during for probably from about uh, 76 to uh, 83. And, you know, we didn't have specific rescue training when something when something happened we would uh we would all get out and scratch our heads and figure out what to do and if someone <coughs> was in trouble we'd jump into the water and we'd get as close to them as possible but in 1979 rick bernard was killed at uh, decapitation rock on section four of the chatuga and Less and Slim were both on the trip. It was they ran very tight trips, very strong crews, and again, this was something that shouldn't have happened. And they went, they went back that winter, developed the first Swift Water Rescue course, and wrote the first book on Swift Water Rescue. 
And the idea that you would actually, you know, spend some serious time training ahead of time, that was a big step. And the same thing was happening in California with Rescue 3. And you guys probably saw more of Rescue 3 than uh, you than you did of NOC's program. Jim Segerstrom was, you know, an amazingly effective instructor. And he focused primarily on teaching first responders, although he did teach professional professional guides too, and taught classes all over the world. Also, what happened was, was uh, the state of Ohio started developing a river safety course. There were a number of dam drownings. The one of the most famous was probably Binghamton, New York. The, you see you see those at the top left, those three firefighters are going in. It wasn't really a person they were going after. They, it was a life jacket or something was circulating around. And they went in there and they were manhandled. And two of them died. And this thing, sort of thing was happening in a number of places. It happened a bunch in Ohio. And what happened in Ohio was that the head of the Division of Watercraft was a botanist, Norv Hall. And it's like, well, what's a botanist going to do with water safety? Well, he was a scientist. And so when you have this new problem, he brought together as many people as he could who had expertise. I really came in late because, because there was a lot of talent in, in Ohio when they developed a number of techniques for doing safe dam rescue, and they expanded it to a general river rescue course. And this is a big deal. Because I'll tell you, I tried to teach firefighters, and they were a tough audience. I'd go, I, I remember going into a room, I think it was down in, in uh, Lee Height in Pennsylvania. They, were, they, the Lee, they worked the Lehigh River, and it was scary to watch them because you'd have a bunch of people running around with, uh, with firefighter gear and, and, uh, and rope coils. And eventually someone was going to, someone was going to get killed. And I went in there and the whole room was sitting there with their arms crossed, just sort of staring at me. And I was, I was able to talk to them a little bit. Uh, I showed them a bunch of, uh, <clears throat> of outtakes, uh, things that Jim, that Jim Segerstrom has sent me from uh, news, which showed rescues that had horribly gone wrong. <coughs> and uh, that was, that, uh, that I think may have gotten them thinking a little bit, but really the problem was that the only paddlers they ever met were the people they were pulling in off the creek. And people I paddled with, we didn't need that kind of help. Now, it, the, uh, over in Pennsylvania, where I was from, um, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission was inspired by Ohio to create their own program to train first their watercraft officers and then their firefighters. Pam Dillon and Virgil Chambers. Pam ran the program in Ohio and Virgil in Pennsylvania. They, again... Once you are, once you have a state agency teaching courses through the fire academy, it gives it a lot of credibility. And all of a sudden, instead of being, because really they were showing up in their fight in their firefighting gear and scratching their heads and trying to figure out what to do, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden now this was just another thing like confined space or uh, or vertical or whatever. It was a thing that you could get training for. And I was really wanting to see that because when you lose first responders, these are people who have ties in the community and <coughs> their death is mourned and they're angry. And because one of the things that happens with death is the first stage is anger. And the, and the people who they're angry at are, you guessed it, paddlers. I did outreach to emergency responders with river safety symposiums 
in Richmond, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., both of those places have urban whitewater. And there was some friction developing with the, uh, with the first responders. And what we did is we had a course where everybody came together and we, you know, the first responders taught us about the incident command system and some of the, and we had people from Ohio and Pennsylvania showing them things. And we did some on water training and it was interesting because for instance, in Richmond, the Bureau of fire did not officially send anybody. Although I was told that these two guys over in the corner, those guys are Bureau of fire. But when I asked them, they denied it. And the same sort of thing was going on in DC. The, one of the fire chiefs said that it was stupid to go out on the river like that because someone was going to get killed. But interestingly, at the end of uh, at the end of that uh, of that symposium, he uh, comes up to me and he bought three hundred rescue bags for his for his fire company. So what we were doing is exposing the people to things, and they're not stupid. We're not going to teach them everything, and they're not going to admit to us that they don't know what they're doing. But like down in Richmond, three weeks later they had rescue three train all of the people who did river rescue big step forward a throw line rescue bag um story behind that is when i was working i was working with the aca to help the red cross develop their canoe and kayak program because they used to have a really big instruction program and there the guy who was coordinating it was a fellow named ray miller and he showed, sent me the drawing that you see at the top, top of the left-hand page and <clears throat> says, you got to try this thing. These are really amazing. Well, you know, I, I thought it was probably a gimmick, but I got a stuff bag and some foam and a rope, took it out to my, to my front porch and threw it. And it's like, holy smokes, this thing works. And I started building rescue bags. And but interestingly, I had that market to myself for a few years because everybody else was trying to make them cheap. And I was making a good, solid product. And now, of course, there are a lot of people making good, solid products and a lot of interesting designs. Got to start somewhere, though. Uh, this is also a time when a number of books and videos got published. Um you know, River Rescue, that was Slim and Les's book, Slim Ray and Les Bechtel. That was probably, you know, that was probably the first book. Um, then uh, the River Safety Report uh, was something that I that I put together, a collection of fatal accident reports. Whitewater Self-Defense was a video. Kent Ford put it together and I helped. And then I worked with... Uh, with Wayne Sunmarker to produce the Whitewater Rescue Manual. Now the 90s, things are really starting to pick up. And you, you had what I call the new school phenomenon. There were a lot of young people who were drawn to the sport, a lot of new gear, and it was a big change because, you know, back when, uh, you know, back when I started, you know, an old boat and worn gear, that meant you were experienced. But now all these kids had new gear and <clears throat> all kinds of stickers. I was sitting in an eddy and this kid pulled up next to me and told me in no uncertain terms why why so, why why my boat was dangerous and I and I didn't know what I was doing. And I just sort of looked at him and said, you know, I was probably running the golly before your parents met. Head on down river, you. <laughs> but uh but you can you can see that uh, things are really starting to pick up. The sport grew really really fast during the nineties. Uh, you can see it only you know it uh, grew by about seventy five percent between nineteen eighty two and two thousand. Whole lot of boat designs. I remember when uh, when Dagger Kayaks was first started. They I was talking to Joe Pulliam, and they had figured out a way to make molds a lot faster. And most companies, oops, they were just doing one boat a year. 
and Joe said, well, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit. And companies were bringing out two, two, three, four boats a year. Now, I mean, shoot, I can't even keep track of it all. It's, it's uh, really exploded. And freestyle kayaking has happened and professional. It's the interesting thing about this is that uh, freestyle slash rodeo. It's not like racing was racing. Everybody came, everybody raced. Now everybody comes to watch the pros race. Eh, I don't like that as much, but uh, it's uh, certainly what these guys are capable of doing the trashing that they're able to take and stay in their boats is really remarkable. Whitewater manufacturing grew. And as you can see from, uh, from some of the, from some of the articles, you know, it started to get a ledge, you know, some companies don't give a crap. There was, there was some, you know, it was, it was starting, it was starting to, uh, it was starting to get a little bit edgier, a little bit more aggressive. And kayak outfitting really improved. Different, different volume craft for different size people, bigger cockpits, shock absorbing bulk, bulkhead foot braces, real back bands that worked, strong grab loops, adjustable thigh braces. I mean, all of these things made the boats that much better and that much safer. I mean, when you think of how small those uh, those those openings were. Now, the Germans had been running large openings for a long time, but the idea people felt that a big cockpit couldn't be kept dry, and Jimmy Snyder felt that way about squirt boats. But there was a there was a guy who weighed about three hundred pounds who wanted to squirt. And so he put his own bigger cockpit in and he found that it worked just fine. And before he knew it, everybody was using the bigger cockpit sizes. But better gear makes it possible to run harder rivers. And the visibility of the sport has attracted some really talented athletes. Oops. Go back there. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I... have <clears throat> Think of the people who I paddled with when I was in my 20s. And there may be one or two of them that who could have run with this crew. The rest of us, we didn't have that, we didn't have that, that kind of ability. And uncommon skills were becoming more common. Falls running has gone mainstream. Summer of 73, you see that picture in the center? That's my old buddy Martin McGunn running Potter's Falls. People thought that was nuts, but, uh, you know, Martin figured out how to do it. He and Mark Hall were the first people to go over it. I ran it once, didn't like it very much, but I, but I was in a minority. Then you get into the, you get into the like, February 79 waterfalls for Britain, fruit or calculated risk. Is this something that people can run. It's not just Potter's Falls. It's all kinds of different falls. And by 1990, it's like, here are the nation's top runnable waterfalls. Quite a change. Rescue vests were first produced in the U.S. in 1990 and sold by Extra Sport. Slim Ray was key to uh, getting them through U.S. Coast Guard approval process because <clears throat> the underwriters' labs did not want to approve them. So when Slim <coughs> organized the 89 International Safety Symposium at the Nantahala, he got this group of international people. They were from all over. They were, they were Germans and Austrians and Italians and Russians and, and, uh, and Frenchmen. And he got them to agree, to vote on standards for the rescue jackets. He then created uh, International Canoe Federation stationery and wrote them out. Everybody signed it. He gave that to the Coast Guard and they went with it. And of course, here's the joke. The Euros thought we were nuts. You know, what are you, you stupid Americans? What are you doing? Well, a couple of years later, what happened in Europe? Well, it was the uh, common market. 
And all of a sudden, they wanted standards. And so we sent the that standard that Slim had developed, which the Coast Guard had approved with these folks, back over to Europe. A lot of paper shuffling. And the first... ACA River Rescue Courses were in 1995. Wayne and I worked together for about three, four years trying to figure out what the best stuff was to teach. We tried all kinds of different modules and different things. Wayne wanted to teach a course that was a week long. And I said, well, you know, Wayne, it would probably be a great course, but you're not going to get people to stay, stay that long. <clears throat> we get people for one or two days and we've got to design a course for that. Wayne, so I was doing a course which I call Whitewater Self-Defense, which was swimming, wading, and throw bags. He took my course and we talked and I figured this is a guy who has a lot of experience with rope from a, because he ran with a rescue squad and uh, he, he was really very knowledgeable about it. And so we sort of filled each, filled each other's, oh, what would you say? We filled the gaps in each other's experience. And, of course, now the program has hundreds of instructors teaching thousands of courses. Kind of neat. And here's the ACA rescue course. Swimming and wading, basic rope handling, boat unpinning, entrapment rescue, including stabilization and snag lines, rescue organization and management. It really works. Uh, it's, you know, one of the things that swimming and wading does, is it gives people a lot of confidence because for a while there, swimming was considered really dangerous. I can remember when I first started teaching it, you know, this, this fellow who I knew would come up and just, Charlie, you're going to kill somebody. you got to stop this. And I'm going, Tom, it's me. What are you doing? But now it's pretty standard. And actually, I went out to California and took a one-day course from, uh, from uh, Rescue 3. And I said, oh, I love these guys because they like to get wet just like I like to get wet. And it's been, you know, it was, it was really encouraging to me to see to see them doing the same thing of course several of their instructors were ex-navy seals and they man they they could swim they could out swim almost anything now of course in the 21st century paddlers are more skilled and better equipped than ever we've also got a proliferation of artificial whitewater courses something that you know, you wouldn't have seen 30, 40 years ago. There was one in Germany, but not too many for a while. And guided rafting has changed. Uh, your, your guests are older. You have both men and women. You have kids. And guided rafting guests now want adventure as long as it's not too adventurous. And it means that you have that outfitters have had to change the way they they attack the river i mean some of the stuff we used to do you would get fired for and of course you have cell phones <coughs> huge huge uh, impact you get people who get into trouble on the river they may not have brought their life jacket but they've got their cell phone and they'll make the call standing on a rock in the middle of the river. And you also get drive-by 911 calls causing unneeded rescues. And one of the stories that I heard was this is on the uh, this is on the on the uh, lower Potomac below where the Shenandoah comes in. Um, somebody somebody's driving by. They look out and they see a couple of guys who had been rafting, they just, their boat was out on the rocks and they were sunning themselves. Well, they decided this was an emergency. They called 911. And by the time, by the time this was over, they had people from, they had people from three different rescue squads because 
This is where several states come together and they closed down the 340 bridge and they landed a helicopter. And in the meantime, the guys had gotten back in the raft and they were paddling downstream and wondering what all the fuss was. It's going to be an on it's going to be an ongoing problem. And I suspect that they'll do something similar to what the local fire company did. I was I was in my office and I look out and it's like, holy smokes, my my car's on fire. Well, I had hit a deer the day before and it was the car was really beat up. But uh, so I was, and so I uh, called the fire department and they about ten minutes later this guy shows up, just a car, one guy, and he's out there. And of course, my wife and I are really nervous. We're afraid the car's going to blow up. And he's just standing by the car. So I figure if he's standing there. He's I probably safe for me to go and talk to him. And I'm hearing him saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are no buildings. It's just a car. Send the small truck. And I said, aren't you afraid it's going to blow up? And he said, only in the movies. Only in the movies. And I think they're going to have to do that sort of thing for 911, for 911 call-ins. Because they, they, they got all these people out there and they spent the next, the next hour, couple of hours trying to find out where the people in distress were. And of course, the people in distress had loaded their boat on the car and were headed home. Digital cameras and GoPros, they have really recorded some amazing rescues. Um, you, can, you can spend uh, a happy, wasteful evening just watching one right after the other. Some of them are quite eye-opening. Now, as as the sport has grown, conflict has developed between between the between traditional park managers and and people in adventure sports because you can't eliminate all the risks. I have a friend of mine, Robert Kaufman, uh, is a professor of outdoor rec, and he wrote a book about about uh, outdoor rec management. And you read the first half, which is about managing parks. Basically, it's like, well, if something is dangerous, you either make it illegal or you uh, make it impossible to do or both. And you can't do that with uh, with things like, like uh, paddling or uh, mountain biking or rock climbing. And... As he got into those, you could just tell that their that their orientation was uh, was changing a little bit. Risks can and these activities can and should be managed by participants. There was a big controversy in after three people were killed in the vicinity of Dimple Rock. That's the rock you see in that newspaper article, and and I. Uh, they, there were people who wanted to blow the rock up or to modify it <clears throat> because one of the people had, had gotten shoved under the rock after their boat tipped over. They eventually decided not to do anything. <clears throat> there was somebody from uh, the state, the uh, state legal department there, and I talked to them and they said, look, if the, the rock as it stands now, um, we have no responsibility for it. It's a natural hazard. We start fixing things, we're responsible for everything, and there is no way we're going to do that. And falls running was a particular challenge because falls running looks pretty crazy. Although, you know, when I, when I went with a group that finally got a hearing between, with the uh, deputy, deputy manager of Pennsylvania State Parks, I had to explain to him, I don't run waterfalls. But this sort of thing is totally mainstream. And I showed him pictures of people running waterfalls, probably about a dozen of them. And a number of them were in national park, were, in, were not national parks, but were in state parks. And so this was, this is, a, this is something that's reasonable. And I'll tell you, people are running things now that I never would have dreamed they would have done. It's clearly 
there are techniques you can use to run very serious waterfalls. Things, I mean, people talk about an easy 50-footer. I wouldn't think there was anything like it, but apparently for the right person, there is. And, of course, the new boats, the way they're constructed, um, makes it a lot easier. Now, of course, you do get fatalities, and we had one at Great Falls of the Potomac. This was Shannon Christie, a young young woman, quite quite charming and charismatic, who was learning how to run harder stuff. And the thing is, you get to these events like the Great Falls race, and you got all these people just going at it, running the falls and running the falls. It's easy to get carried away. And the thing about Great Falls is. There are some really dangerous spots. And the thing that you see at the right side of that fall of the falls, that's uh, that's one of the uh, fingers in the center. And it is an evil finger indeed. Uh, you go in there, you're going to die. Yeah, that those rocks that you see are known as a subway. And <clears throat> they were able to get her out, but it took several hours. They had some very capable people getting her out. And then I'm not going to talk a lot about accidents, but one of the things that I try to do is to get people talking. Get people talking about this stuff. And this is one one place. This is a river called Chiowa where we get about eight releases a year. There were there were two fatalities in in the rapid on the right side of the island below Bear Creek Falls. Maria Noakes and I forget what his first name was, Mr. Clark. But in any case, these were both very skilled paddlers, highly thought of in their community, and no one saw what happened. But we do know one thing. If you go to the right side of the island, you better have you better have your head screwed on right. And it makes sense to get over to the left side, but it's kind of hard because you go over Bear Creek Falls, which is this 12-foot double drop, and you're above the island and you have to sort of work your way over to the to the island at the top of the page and to the other side. And People are so relieved after running Bear Creek that, you know, maybe they weren't doing it, but that it would get these two people and no one saw it happen because most of the people were going on the other side. One thing that I hope that the accident reports do is get people aware of spots that are dangerous, even to skilled people. And this was the midnight miracle, the most incredible rescue I have ever seen in my in my 50 years of accident reporting. You can see at the top, it's showing the river at, at sort of a normal summer level. Well, well uh, there was a guy who was running laps on it. And what happened was between his, his first lap and his second lap, the release water from the gully got there because it was a gully release weekend. And the water was going all the way across to that arrow that says undercut wall and he was boating by himself and he came out of his boat and was shoved into that corner and here's what happened a woman saw his boat floating around and and pulled it in um got online, asked if anybody had seen a boat, <laughs> it lost the boat, saw that there was one vehicle with racks on it. She uh, looked, there was a phone number, a message with a phone number underneath uh, the windshield wipers. She called that number. It was a photographer who'd been taking, who'd taken pictures of the guy's first run. And he was going back for another run. <clears throat> that was the one he got into trouble on. And so she's saying, you know, it looks like this guy got into trouble. And so she posted so she posted on Facebook. And Corey Lilly, one of the best paddlers in the Fayetteville area, saw that and said, 
I know what happened. I know where he is. The rescue squads who had been called out aren't going to be able to get him because you you can just imagine trying to get in there when there's like six inches of water coming over that whole that whole face. And so he rallied about four of his buddies at ten o'clock at night. They went to, they went they went to, they went down to Kanawha Falls, got out there, found him, lowered ropes and got him out. Amazing story. And one that wouldn't have happened before social media. Now, American Whitewater has been collecting these accidents, mostly me, but some other people, in the, in the accident database. To try and, it's not 100% complete, and I'll talk about that a little later, but it gives a good snapshot of what's, of what's, going, of what's going on out there. Um, you can, you can see, uh, that you, the number of PFDs, East versus West. And one of the things you know, notice about, about Western, uh, the, uh, upward blips and Western deaths, they, they coincide with, uh, high water and that low point that you see over, uh, over on the left, that was a terrible drought that hit, uh, that hit where a lot of the a lot of the rivers dry, dried up. We have about 20, 22, 2300 of these accident reports, and they're very very accessible. And uh, again, trying to get people to to report accidents, to talk about accidents, to think about it. I don't have all the answers, but we want what I'm trying to do is to get everybody working on their awareness because paddling is so much fun it's hard it's hard but you can never forget what you're dealing with just like when you're driving a car you never forget what you've got between your hands and here we have so these are charlie duffy's um <coughs> um accident accident graphs he's been very helpful to me cause, boat type, accidents by class. You know, most of the accidents are in class two, three, two, three, and four, what you'd expect. The busiest month is June, warm weather and high water. And here is, this is kind of in, interesting because what we found was, of course, the U.S. Coast Guard gets a lot more accidents than we do. And part of it is that they do flat water accidents, and I don't do flat water accidents. And but we get some that they don't. And there are all kinds of little kinks. I remember talking to the boating law administrator in Ohio, excuse me, not Ohio, Idaho, and he said that uh, he didn't get some of the accident reports because certain sheriffs refused to send the reports in. You know these uh, sovereign sheriff nonsense. They said it's none of the government, none of the state government's business. What's going on here? But uh, you can you can you can see that uh, we got some that they didn't, and one of them, for instance, was uh, Chuck Kern, which occurred in Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. I don't know how that one slipped by, but it does, and. I know from trying to collect accidents that it's hard. You can also see that, uh, that, that the accidents are split between white water and flat water and the ocean. I suspect by now there's a lot more ocean and a lot more flat water. Now, white water paddlers generally take care of each other, which is one of the reasons that we don't make the acquaintance of rescue squads. A lot of what rescue squads do is flood rescue, stranded person rescue, search for missing person, and vehicle rescue. And the search for missing person and the stranded person are what they're typically called out for with paddlers. And we watch out for each other so we don't have missing people. And if somebody is stranded, we paddle over to them and... Uh, get them to where their boat is or bring their boat over to them. So we don't, 
we don't need them unless something really horrible has happened. Charlie, we've got one other category here in uh, Albuquerque, the uh, drainage ditches coming down from the mountains. Whenever we have a good rain, the uh, uh, swift water rescue people from the first responders head over to the uh, to the drainage areas in case people get swept into those uh, drainages. Because they're not used to seeing water in them. California <laughs> has the same issues. No, I'm a quick note on that too. Uh, Albuquerque has changed their technique. They used to stretch a line perpendicular across the current uh, between two posts and they realized that didn't work because they just got stuck in a V down in the current. So now they, they stretch their ropes diagonally across the current and they try to snag the person that's drifting down and take them to the downstream side of the post. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were the people who really pioneered how to, how to work with those, with those drainage issues. There was uh, I think Sandia labs put, put some things together. We do have a local rescue a friend of mine that I used to boat with a long time ago. He's got a Royal rescue and he was a fire department uh, member. <coughs> But a Royal Rescue does all kinds of high angle rescue and and water rescues. Uh, it's a great resource for a lot of the commercial fire departments he trains here. Yeah. Now this is an example of the sort of rescue that I sort of shake my head with. These two guys got their drift boat stuck. So what are they doing? They're just sitting there. I mean, look at the river. You could swim to safety. They've got life jackets on. The uh, a power boat tried to get to them. They couldn't. They eventually were pulled out by helicopter. They were they were probably running a one boat trip. And the problem with one boat trips is, when if you get in trouble, it's not that much. It's not that different from uh, being solo, and uh, you really don't have any any backup. Where if there was a second boat, that second boat could have waded downstream. They could have hopped out of the boat and picked them up or could have come downstream and eddied out and tried to help them get the boat off. These are the sort of things that give us a bad name. <clears throat> Whitewater rescue teams vary hugely in skills and resources. I mean, look at that, that crew on the top left from Anchorage. They're in a raft rescuing a pin kayaker. They got a chainsaw going. I mean, whoa. <coughs> That's pretty amazing. And the and the uh, the lower picture is uh is from uh, is from the uh is from the DC DC area. Uh Sandy Spring is one of the rescue teams that work that works on the Potomac, and these guys spend a good bit of time out patrolling. And so they get pretty good with their boats. But one mistake that they, that they sometimes make is they figure that, it, that there will be a piece of gear that is a magic bullet. Whereas Swift Water Rescue is, is, not, is, is not gear intensive. And many, many Swift Water Rescues Techniques are counterintuitive, like leaning downstream uh, when you're broached. And without the right training, rescuers die. And in fact, what, hap this, what happened here is this airboat went into the backwash of a dam. They thought that it would be able to go there. Well, unfortunately, the, the hydraulic broke up the air cushion, flipped the boat, and uh, you know when the when the dust set, when the dust settled, uh, you know there were there were there was a fatality. And helicopters are very useful for transportation, but they they aren't always helpful for rescue. You can sometimes pluck somebody out of a tree or out of the river, but uh, generally, you know you you have to get somebody. To a safe spot where they're not washing down the stream before before a helicopter can be helpful. California has an amazing network of helicopters. 
you know, you uh, you go in someplace, and I I've got bunches of reports where somebody is like at Adam Bomb Falls, or is uh, or is in Royal Gorge, or one of these places, and somebody gets hurt, they hit their EPIRB, and a few hours later, a chopper shows up. Well, nice work if you can get it. And nowadays, um, there is the sport is incredibly diverse, and and uh, what's what's going here? Okay, is incredibly diverse. All kinds of different types of craft. You get you you got a pack raft. You've got uh, stand up paddle boards. You've got you've got. All kinds of things, even pool toys are being taken down. And most of the newcomers, and this has really happened after the pandemic, they're not looking for trouble. They just want a nice day on the river. But they get on the river and all of a sudden there's a little bit of current and maybe a downed tree. And they're in over their heads and somebody, somebody gets hurt. And... You know, really, the trick is, you know, we're hoping to, you know, is to try and do as much outreach as we can to let people know what the dangers are of moving water so they can identify them. Because, you know, I'm a, I grew up in New York City. It amazed me that rivers weren't the same level every time you went there. I, that really, that really shook me up at first. <clears throat> But uh, there's a, there are certain things that we can teach people. And, of course, the most important is wearing a life jacket. Because there are an awful lot of, he was paddling, his boat tipped over, and he never came to the surface. Because what happens is what uh, boating safety people call the sudden disappearance syndrome. Somebody falls in, they get disoriented, they swim the wrong way and run out of air. Nasty. Okay. And I always I always like to like to talk about we you know William Neely's comment that whitewater is really safe except when it's not. You can get away with the most incredible stupidity and sometimes you can't. As William said, it's often better to be lucky than good. <coughs> and the freedom to take calculated risks, whether it's business, love, or white water, is one of the most cherished prerogatives of a free people. And one of the things that we had to explain to a lot of the boating safety people is that this is what we do. But the, but they're calculated risks, and they're not crazy. And that's the second part. With freedom comes responsibility. And that's a picture of me in the Cheat Canyon, which is just down the road. Now, I'm, I'm going to end with a plug. Um, the uh, Whitewater Rescues, this, these are near-miss stories from the American Whitewater Accident Database about 80 of them and you know fatality reports they're useful but it can get kind of depressing these these are pretty uplifting these are pretty amazing stories and the book is coming out april 17th <clears throat> if you want a copy you can grab it on amazon they're they're taking they're taking early orders and I thank you all very much for listening, and do we have any questions? Charlie, I'd like to say that was an amazing talk, and, and we really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're on the East Coast and a couple hours ahead of us, so it's getting late for you, but we really appreciate your time and uh, talking to our club and there's a lot of comments in the chat of how appreciative they are for you doing this. It's a, it's a nice opportunity. And 
course, you know, I don't do that much for ACA with ACA anymore. I've had some injuries and I've let my, my teaching certs lapse, but I'm still bird dogging the accident reports and uh, very interested in having people send me information. I have a, uh, you know, I have a Facebook page, which has been very helpful in terms of getting accident, accident reports. And there yeah, is I, think, a, I think the last time uh, we spoke was regarding a fatality on the Gila here in New Mexico last year. Some of our members were first on scene after that happened. Yeah. And, okay, I'm, uh, looking, I'm looking at the chat and I'm uh, just looking at questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Where is the cover of your new book located? What do you mean? I have no idea where they got the picture. Okay. <laughs> Hey, I, I had some ideas. These guys had other ideas. And it's interesting working with them because they are good promoters. Okay, and another quick, yeah, go ahead. Compared to this, to, compared to the Whitewater Rescue Manual, they have, you know, I've done interviews with, uh, with, a, with a bunch of magazines and, uh, they're they're really getting the word out. Okay, another question. Any other places to buy the book besides Amazon? Is it available um, on your website? I'm not selling the book. Okay. Um, can you go directly to Menasha Press? And yes, you can go directly to Menasha. Okay, another comment. Just bought your book off of Amazon. I'm sorry. Somebody's a comment. That somebody said they just bought your book off of Amazon in real time here. Yeah, well, well, it's uh, you know, it's an easy place for people to find stuff. You know, I I read all my books on Kindle. Mm -hmm. They have it on Kindle too. They probably do. They do. Makes sense. I just love it because, you know, I've got 50, 60 books on Kindle, including about eight or 10 that I like to read. And I just want to say, uh, you know, I really appreciate your service throughout what well, it's been 40 years just compiling all of these and and making the sport safer. Uh, and, and Well, it's, the stories are really compelling. And, you know, I was always interested in the accident reports when I was a, when I was a hiking and camping leader. And so now, you know, when I hear about something, I just want to know what happened. I'd like to say that Charlie did give us the option for a very dark, kind of morbid uh, presentation on all the fatalities, and and I opted for this presentation uh, with a few few stories for emphasis. So, yeah, the other one probably has oh, probably two dozen accidents that I go over, but you know about. About half are accidents and half are near misses. And, you know, you just, it's, it's sometimes a little, a little bit too much for folks because uh, I know that uh, my wife doesn't proofread my, my articles because it gives her nightmares. Well, I've certainly... never had a nightmare. I'll encourage everybody to visit Charlie's website and see all the information that he has available and, and all the books that he's written. And yeah, I, I'll second Tom's uh, voice in saying that Charlie has done so much for our, our sport and the industry and the history and the safety of, of whitewater rafting. So thank you, Charlie. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, really enjoy being a part of this community and uh you know 
everything that everything that I've given, I've always gotten back. Yeah, the the compilation of uh, reports from the Grand Canyon. Uh, curious thing that seems to keep happening is they get up in the morning and they see a trail of footprints going down to the water and somebody missing and they never recover well they may recover the body yeah uh, and sometimes that per sometimes that person has had too much to drink and well they <clears throat> I, I you know you think that i they, that's not the conclusion that they come to so i'm not uh, anyway you know the solution to that is to have a pee bucket and <laughs> And not go down to the river in the middle of the night, whether you're drunk or not, especially if you're drunk. And that, that way, uh, it's kind of a curious thing. I, I don't know if they really know what, what happens. They just find the tracks. Yeah, well, you certainly, you certainly don't want to be in that river without a PFD. Yeah. Even with a PFD, the water's cold. At night. Yeah. Well, Tom, I think we can go ahead and stop the recording. Um, I know it's late for, for Charlie, but uh, folks are welcome to stay on for a little longer. If, if anybody's got a trip coming up that you want to share or comments, or if you want to speak out to Charlie right now, it's your chance. Okay, I'm trying to get to the stop. Recording. Alrighty, well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your hey. years of service and, and the, the talk tonight. You're, you're very welcome. Have a great paneling season. You're a legend, Charlie.